Pete Wishart. Yeah. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, of all the things that this House can do to endear itself to the good people of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, spending billions of pounds on renovating the place where we, the members of Parliament, do our work, probably just about wouldn't make the top ten of those priorities. <laughs> In these days of austerity, where we're still going through all the horrors and psychodramas of this crazy Tory Brexit, it almost seems like it's designed to intentionally wind up the good people of this country. So I sincerely wish this House all the very, very best in trying to sell this to what is a sceptical and, frankly, had enough nation. Well, I barely started, but I will, given it's the chair of the It just uh, amuses me, Madam Deputy Speaker, that the Honourable Gentleman is critical of spending money on the UK Parliament, and yet there are colleagues of all of ours up the road as he would say, in a wonderful, <laughs> splendid, modern parliament building uh, that costs the taxpayer quite a lot of money. There's two things I'll say. There's two things I'll say to the right honourable lady. And she's already here in the chorus of one of them. It costs less than Portland House House. And if she wants to know about difficulties, about designing a parliament and creating a parliament, she only really needs to look at the experience of the Scottish Parliament. That was one of the first pieces of work that the Scottish Parliament get, went, get down to. And I tell her, it wasn't that particularly easy. There was real, real discontent oh, when it came to that. This is what this House can experience. This is what it's got to look forward to, because you've got to try and sell this to a sceptical nation. And I wish you all the very, very best in this. And on that, Madam Deputy Speaker, maybe I should declare an interest. Or maybe that's a disinterest. Because let me tell you, Madam Deputy Speaker, me and my colleagues don't intend to be here yeah. in yeah. yeah. particular. <laughs> we, we don't even <laughs> we don't intend. Madam <laughs> Deputy <laughs> 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 Speaker, I was going to tell a few jokes in my speech, but I think we have the funniest one <laughs> <laughs> in the of the Labour Party gaining any seats from the SNP because that is the best joke that we will do today. <laughs> Can I declare I my disinterest? Because we're not going to be here. We're probably not going to be, even be here at the commencement of this project, given the touches progress that this has so made me. So we'll let you get on with your vital yeah. restoration like, and renewal work while we get down to the business of restoring and renewing our beautiful country in the shape of the priorities of the Scottish people. And I like the way they call it restoration and renewal. R and R. Who doesn't like a bit of R and R? Everybody likes that. If they actually called it the restoring of a parliament for the members of parliament of this country, I'm sure they'll just have a few more difficulties in trying to explain that to the people of this country. And good luck defending the four to six billion pounds that you're going to have to spend in actually Sorry. restoring and renewing this place. Of course, I'll give it to you. I'm very grateful uh, to my honourable friend for giving me. And he may recall, indeed, when uh, the National Assembly for Wales had a new building, uh, the cost was sixty million pounds, and the Conservative Party, in particular, ran a full-scale campaign against that expenditure. Uh, yet they seem very relaxed of spending uh, well over five billion pounds in this Parliament. I, I've, I have to say very candidly to my honourable friend, I've given up trying to second guess what this Conservative Party say about anything when it comes to spending <laughs> in this particular country. But I think the people of the United Kingdom will, will actually now try to be f figuring out how many schools and hospitals would four to six billion pounds create. And I'm pretty certain that all of you over there will be reminded of that right until your posteriors return to these restored and renewed green benches. And I, I of course I give way to the honourable just so he knows, I agree with him. Every £100 million we spend on this permanent replica chamber is £100 million less for teachers and doctors and nurses and all the rest. So I just want him to know that I'm fully on his side. Well, both of you should Madam Deputy Speaker, it's always curious who you pick up in the way of allies when you're going through particular issues and projects. But I'm grateful to the right honourable gentleman for making that additional comment. Yes, of course. Madam Deputy Speaker, I thank the member for giving way. It just so happens, as I shall touch on in my own contribution, that I was on the Hollywood Progress Group, the group in charge of building the Scottish Parliament oh, yeah. building. And I can remember the fury, the sound and the fury in the brickbats that came my way, John Hume Robertson's way and Linda Fadibiani's way, as we proceeded with the project. And yet I'm bound to say this, and I think my Scottish National Party friends would agree, that now that the building is finished, 
Scotland is extremely proud of that building, here, here. and nobody mentions the price any more. And I, for one, am proud to have been involved in building such a landmark in Scotland's here, here. history. That, Madam T- Deputy Speaker, I'm tempted to say, so it's all his fault then, <laughs> but I won't do that, Madam Deputy Speaker. I know, and I know it. I just suggest to the Honourable Gentleman before he gets all shut you. But and he's absolutely right. That was a tortuous pro- pro- programme for the Scottish Parliament. And I actually commend the Honourable Gentleman because I knew he served on that, what was equivalent to the Liberal Authority, with distinction and with hard work. And it was down to these people who actually designed all that. But let's, let's not forget just about the fuss that was created in a very modest build, a build that cost less than Port Cullis House yes. when we're talking about four to six billion pounds. But nobody actually believes it's going to be four billion pounds. Come on. It's never going to be four billion pounds. Most people suspect okay. that that figure will come in probably closer to 10 to 12 billion pounds. And that's even before we find out all the different things that's going to be underneath there as we start to dig under. We've already heard about Edward the Confessor. That was just in the car park of this building. Goodness <laughs> knows what else will be discovered in terms of some of the archaeological programmes that we're going to be doing. So I salute you, um, this House, in your bold and courageous move, and I look forward to you selling this to yeah, the people yeah. of this nation. And from afar, we will be watching you and wishing you all the best as you get down to restoring and renewing this building. But I agree, this building is falling down and it's becoming a hazard to all those who work in here. Decades of neglect and indecision has seen to that. Anybody who stands still for a moment in this place now has a a very good chance of being hit by fallen masonry. It's so overrun with vermin that even the mice in this house now wear overalls (laughs) because a decades of prevarication this building has practically fallen down. And it's been the failure of successive governments to face up to rear their responsibilities means that we now have a building that could face a catastrophic failure or a massive fire at any time. And everybody's made the comparisons about Notre Dame, and it's right, and I know the Leader of the House has said that in her many comments about this. We're doing this as an imperative now because what happens to Notre Dame? But there are, of course, key differences between this house in that cathedral on the Seine. We've got one building where people think that they speak to God, and in the other place is the Notre Dame Cathedral. <laughs> so, Mr. S- M- Madam Deputy Speaker, I probably won't come as a great surprise to you that <laughs> me and my SNP colleagues don't share the same UEI nostalgia and affection for this place that some honourable and right honourable members actually do. I mean, I have to say, I'll, I personally, I love this building. It's a truly iconic building. It's a real pleasure to work in it, walking down Victoria Street as I come to work. There's a real sense of pride that I'm coming down to work in what is a fantastic building. But I have to say to you, Madam Deputy Speaker, I could probably just about discharge my responsibility as a member of Parliament from somewhere else. I think mm. I would probably just about be able to do this. This is, it is, this is a beautiful building but it also comes with particular historic baggage. It's a building which is very much associated with the height of empire when it was built and some of the worst excesses of global imperialism, which we have to concede was a feature of 19th century United Kingdom. It's a building which is ingrained with 19th century power relationship, a cap-duffing, forelock-tugging historic culture, where we even have one part of the building where we refer to them as lords and ladies, and we actually think that's okay. What type of building is this that can create this type of culture? So I sort of suggest that if we are serious about being a new, modern 21st century parliament, we should have the building that reflects our new ambition and our new aspirations. Not trying to shoehorn a parliament into a mock, gothic, Victorian tourist attraction. Why are we not thinking about, properly thinking about oh, of course, the leader of the house. <laughs> Well, I have always loved the Honourable Gentleman's banter, but I just gently point out to him he will be aware that his Honourable Friend, the Member for Dundee East, is a member of the House of Commons Commission. And I do remember feisty discussions with me worrying about the value for money for taxpayers and him absolutely insisting that this money must be spent and we must get on with the project. So it's a slightly different story that he's telling now. It was his Scottish Nationalist member of the House of Commons Commission who wants this work to go ahead. And she was right in one respect. It was the Scottish National Party member of the House of Com- Commons Commission, but I am now the new member of the House of Commons yeah, Commission. Yeah. So ah. it isn't my right honourable friend, yeah. the member will for it, Dundee East. And, we are, and just, uh, I'll give way in a minute, just, a friend, just, just to, to, 
just to um, respond to the Leader of the House. We are all for moving out of this place. Of course we are. We have to move out of this place. I mean, it is ridiculous to try and to ensure that we stay in a place that's practically fallen down, which is infested with vermin, which is no place for our visitors to come to. It's right that we move out, and it is an imperative we do that. Now, we're coming on to what I think we should have been moving out to and what we should do about trying to ensure we get value for money, because I think that's the key feature when we're going to discuss these things today. Now, I know this is a very tech mechanical bill which just provides the governance of how we move forward, but it's very much caught up with the whole idea about what we do in terms of how we present a modern parliament in the future. And I want to come on to some of the key features with this, but before I do, I give way to my honourable friend. Well, I, I, I thank my honourable friend for giving way, and I think he's making exactly that point. No one's arguing against spending any money whatsoever. It's about achieving value for money and doing the right thing. And if you look at the Scottish Parliament, a new modern chamber with electronic voting that was accessible to everyone, that had normal daylight coming in, is what was spent with that money. Um, What seems to be being proposed here is simply to to do everything up and keep it exactly the same, which is still not actually fit for purpose. And and, and that is the key point. Why are we taking this place apart only to reassemble it in the same way, doing the same old bad things in the same old type of venue. Exactly. It's just so unimaginative. It's like those somebody who ever presented this idea must have been up, up all night thinking about that one, shouldn't they? You know? Let's just come <laughs> back to the same place that we're going to be leaving. And even when we're going out temporarily, let's just create a carbon copy version of that, then come back to the same place. It is, makes absolutely no sense. And the last thing I'll say about this building, Madam Deputy Speaker, and when I look around it, when I sort of sense this building, it's, it's, I think it's a, a sort of sad metaphor of Brexit. Britain, dilapidated, follicky bits round their ears, unloved, and which could go up in flames at any minute. Isn't that a, a true and fantastic representation of the Brexit Britain that we're heading to? So maybe this parliament and this building is exactly what this country deserves. But we have to move out, and the Leader of the House is right in this. We need to make sure that we move out in this for the the very much the the case of the thousands of people who work in this place, the many visitors that come to this place, and it's for them that we must put first and move out. But as I said, to simply move out to come back to the same building with with all its cultural and historic trappings, I think is a a serious mistake. And it's it's a real pity that we weren't listened to when we were going through these committees. And consider, you know, like, Sell, selling this off to the private sector. They'll be queuing up, they'll bite your arm to get hold of a place like this, a UNESCO site, one of the most iconic buildings in the world. They would have made, they would have been queuing up, they've been fighting over each other to get their hands on this. Now, put this off to the private sector, which would save us obviously billions and billions of pounds in this redevelopment, because obviously they would be expected to meet most of the costs. And then we move out. <coughs> to a new building, a new building which could meet our requirements as a modern 21st century democracy, that would meet all the security arrangements that we obviously need, that would actually accommodate 650 members. I mean, we can't even sit in this place. So why didn't we think about that seriously? And I think it was a huge deficiency that that wasn't properly put. And I commend my honourable friend, the member for, member for Adrian Schultz, who took this through committee to try and ensure that this was actually going to be considered properly. It wasn't even given the time of day to, to, when it was looking at this. And I think the House has definitely let the, house, the, the country down by not, not doing this. And imagine if we did sell it off. I mean, what I would like to see this happen to this House, it should become a, a museum to British democracy, where people could come in and amuse themselves about <laughs> how members of Parliament <laughs> behaved and did their business in the early 21st century, braying like perfidious donkeys on speed because they can't actually clap to show approval in this place, wandering around in circles after circles after circles for hours upon hours upon hours just to register the decision about what happens in this place. And they, know what they could laugh out loud. They called themselves honourable and right honourable. I mean, you could just imagine the joy and amusement that would brought, be brought to visitors from right around the world to come to the Museum of British Democracy here in this UNESCO site in the House of Commons. So it's a failure of diligence of this House that that was obviously not considered. But we now have this bill, and it is based on decisions that were taken last year. And it is all about the governance. The Leader of the House is right in that. It does create this parliamentary work, work sponsor body, and we will now also have the delivery authorities, a company limited by guarantee. And it is reminiscent of the London Olympics. But I was here during the London Olympics, Madam Deputy Speaker. I was actually here when it was actually first considered. And can I say to the Leader of the House that 
The London Olympics, and the way that it was shaped up in its delivery body, wasn't it all exactly a positive experience for us from Scotland, from Wales, mm -hmm. and from the regions of the United Kingdom? What I remember about the way that the London Olympics was designed is we got practically next to nothing in the way of contracts. We had large sums of our lottery money diverted to pay for activity down here, and it took years and years of wrangling over the Barnet consequentials. It took years of wrangling over that. What the government attempted to do during the Olympics was try to designate spending in London to build all this activity as UK-wide spending. Uh, yep. Yep. And it was only, that, if I can remember correctly, it was only with the intervention of the Prime Minister and the Chancellor of the che Exchequer that this was eventually resolved in the Joint, joint, um, joint Committee of this House. So this, this wasn't good for us, Madam Deputy Speaker, and that's why my honourable friend from Adrian Schwartz has to be supported in this. This has to be a project for the whole of the United Kingdom. We are all so short by the Olympics, and it has to be seen to be real benefits for the nations in the regions of, of the U UK. So I really hope that when we do get to committee when it comes to this, that my honourable friend has listened to very carefully and patiently when well, an honourable, an, an honourable member says, as and him. Well, I think we've got an alliance here, Madam Deputy Speaker, which, knowing the honourable gentleman and my honourable friend, would be a formidable alliance, which will obviously deliver this. So I look forward to them getting substantial and solid results. And I'm seeing the Leader of the House perhaps looking on to see how she will be able to take them on, you know, to ensure that we do get this so across the whole thing. <laughs> and, Madam Deputy Speaker, we, we haven't got an issue with the Northern East States programme. We've been looking at the plans for what's happening in Richmond House, it's pretty hard to see how any alternative could be designed. And I know it was a hard job to figure out where we would go. And I, I don't really think that there's an issue at all about how that should be done up, and I think it was the right choice for this. And I, I mean, I, I'm looking at the figures, and I think it's vaguely costed at half a billion pounds, which will then become some sort of education centre that's not been specified and determined yet, so we're not really too sure about what's going to be created by this. But one thing about what they're intending to do with, 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 with um, Richmond House is create a carbon copy of this place. Have we all seen the photographs of this? Mm -hmm. I'm looking around and everybody's sort of saying, yes, yes, they have. It's almost exactly the same. It's this place. Yeah. What is the point of that? Yeah. What is the point of moving all this to somewhere else, which will exist for six years and then become something else again? Why are we not using this opportunity to do something more imaginative? Why aren't we thinking about all the issues and difficulties that we have in this place, about the laborious processes that we have, some of the ridiculous and silly conventions where it's even the job of the Speaker, apparently, to dress us, the male members of this House? How, how about looking at some of these ridiculous, absurd things that we do, which wastes our time and which gets in the way about how we approach our business in this House? Why can't we go away from a few years and do things like a 21st century parliament. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with that idea mm. about going to the northern estate and doing something different and then coming back here? Then you could come back to your 19th century palace and you could get on with your usual business, but it's just su such a lack of imagination that there isn't. And we're, like, we're going to a place... But, yes, of course. Actually, I know he's having fun, but there is a kernel of truth in this. One of the reasons why they're having to demolish Richmond House is that the House authorities insisted that they wanted exactly the same size chamber and these very wide division lobbies, which means you've got to demolish a whole list of building. If during this temporary decant we had modern voting, as they do in every other parliament in Europe, and just had a card you put next to a machine, we wouldn't need these division lobbies, you wouldn't need to demolish Richmond House. So, 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 madam, I'm warming to the honourable gentleman. You know what I mean? that's, that's two interventions in a row where there is absolutely practically nothing I can disagree with. And I think we're getting alliances building up all over the place, and who knows, we might actually be able to make some progress when it comes to modernising this place, about making it look and feel like something belonging to this century, not the, the 19th century. And I'm pretty certain he's already thinking about, I'm going to vote for this guy for speaker. Because that's the sort of agenda that I will be putting forward, <laughs> Madam Deputy Speaker. Proper reform of this place, because I tell you something, reform cannot come quick enough. And I'm looking forward to support right across the House for that agenda. So lastly, Madam Deputy Speaker, as I can see that I'm, 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 I'm wearing your patience a little thin in some of these things, and I, I do accept that. We won't oppose the second reading this evening. And I think that I hope that some of our modest suggestions and proposals will be at least considered, even just for the temporary can. There's no reason 
reason why we can't do things a little bit differently. B, a little bit more imaginative in how we do our business. Have a look and see if these silly, absurd conventions actually have any value and work for us. Let's redesign how we work in this place. We will be watching. We will be watching just how much this is going to cost. This is because I have to say to the, the House again, you know, this, this isn't going to go down well. I don't think the public have actually quite caught on to this yet. Maybe after my speech they might have, uh, but yeah. I don't think the public have really realised what this House is doing with this money. Because if it's going to be a 10 to 12 billion pounds price tag that you're going to get, I can only foresee difficulties, problems and issues as you try and progress this through the House. So best of luck with all of this. But we won't oppose this tonight. We will try and get something for our nations in the regions of England when it comes to this. And I hope that the House considers that as we go through committee. Yeah. Yeah.